So as usual, we can start off with the prayer for teacher and student. Om Sahana Abhavatu Sahar Viryam Karavavihai Tejasvinavaditam Mastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 May that one protect us both. May that one nourish us both. May we work together with great energy. May our study be illumined. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. As after assuredly, vowing that we will not unnecessarily cavil with each other. So, normally on a Sunday we have been on to serious question and answer, and the purpose of that is discussing principles. But the purpose of having this Wednesday evening is it's more toward practical things seekers what can we do in a spiritual life understanding that spiritual life will go extremely smoothly if there are no obstacles actually the whole of life will go smoothly if there are no obstacles and so it is necessary to identify what kinds of obstacles might be in our way in our general life path life path meaning if we take seriously that the goal of life is to manifest divinity from within, then anything, uh, then the whole of life is orientated toward that and any obstacle toward that will need to be in some way dealt with. So I wait with bated breath to see, are there any questions? Um, yeah, I have a question, Swamiji. I suppose it's around intention. Um, and I obviously have my daily routine and my daily practice and I ask for guidance and I, I suppose in my daily work, I, I try and see that work as, as the divine and the results of, or the fruits of that labor are not mine. Now I find that one difficult to manage sometimes because when one has success, um, you prob I probably feel that the ego kicks in and I have been successful. But um, I've had two situations happen to me. Uh, one was where in my meditation, everything was going well. Um, and this happened some time ago. And I asked Sri Ramakrishna to kind of send me a curveball because I think I was on one of these sessions and you had said life was a game. And that that's how we should see everything. And I had a nightmare of a day the following day. And my next meditation session, I asked them not to send me any more curveballs. But I was having a difficult week this week. And yet I meditated every morning. Whereas yesterday morning, I had a very, very early phone call. And I didn't get a chance to do my meditation. And I had an incredibly successful day. <laughs> but... But I felt um, this morning I was apologizing for not doing my meditation the previous morning. And I, I genuinely felt guilty. I went, oh, my God, if, 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 if Swami finds out or if anybody finds out, you know, that scenario, which is, which is kind of, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm only human. But, um, but in my meditation this morning, I, I tried to kind of ask for forgiveness or sorry I forgot to do my 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 japa and my meditation and I found it very difficult and I don't know why but I found it very difficult to be really and truly sincerely sorry because I had such a successful day yesterday <laughs> so I was kind of saying look Sri Ramakrishna I don't know how this game works out but if I miss a day or two and it ends up being so successful so be it but on a serious note um I did feel feel a guilt or I felt a sense of remorse that I missed it and I'm just wondering I mean hu human frailties and all that this whole game of life um just 
I, I'm not sure which way is up right now because I've had all those scenarios. Um, I feel good about life. I, I remind myself that the divine is there, but you know, sometimes I wish I had a better practice. Um, and then sometimes I wish I had the successful days that I had yesterday. So it's just, that's my dichotomy. Sorry. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with success and there's nothing wrong with having a successful day and there's nothing wrong with having a life that enjoys all that life has to offer because everything is a gift freely given and uh, we should accept it with uh, grace whether we did our uh, any morning practice or not you see uh, what we call a personal god is just that unmanifest, crystallized as a cosmic mind for us. And that is an entity that is real. It is an entity that can be talked to. It is an entity in whose company we can bask. It's an entity that we can ask things of. It is an entity that we can make adoration and offerings to. Uh, but from that that entity's point of view, there's no judgment or criticism. You have to understand that. Nobody is putting you under a lens. And uh, sometimes we have to change our deep-rooted upbringing and cultural thinking that says that there is an entity uh, looking at us with a critical eye. And uh, when we don't think of that, then we might think that there's an earthly entity or equally with a white beard uh, dressed in uh, Geroa cloth and looking at us from afar askance. So I think we have to acknowledge one thing about ourselves. We are human. And there's nothing wrong with being human. It's only that if you follow the entirely, entirely human um, point of view and approach. Uh, that is, if we take our embodied self seriously, it brings us pain. That's the only problem. Now, that seems not to be the case if you, okay, you didn't have a good practice in the morning and you had a fantastic day, whether you had a fantastic day or not, there's only one entity that provided it for you. <laughs> Regardless, and it wasn't because you did or didn't do any kind of meditation. So if that entity is the nearest to you, let us take the example of a friend. A friend is an entity that we can, if it's a true friend, share anything, share our intimate, most, in, intimate, in, intimate, most secrets with. Uh, the only difference, of course, is that which we call the Lord or the intimate friend or the infinite invisible knows in advance, knows everything. He's omniscient after all. So knows every thought that you have, knows every movement that you have, knows every intention that you have. It's not a surprise. It's not when you sit down and say, oh, and by the way, I did this and that, and please forgive me for this and that and the other because we have to be very very careful about falling into a trap of the past past tense because the past is gone even when i said gone that also is gone so and you can't bring it back fortunately we have a framework of time which acts like a flow and we divide things up thinking that there's a flow of time and there are units called seconds or minutes minutes for activity seconds for thinking whatever it is whether it's an activity or a thought dwelling on the past is not much value unless we're reflecting on the past in order to bring up good memories useful memories memories which enrich us memories which are positive but dragging up memories which are negative will only produce negativity in us. Regret, remorse, guilt, sorrow, all of these things will simply produce their own content. 
if you want to be sorrowful, then dwell on sorrow. And this is the key, of course, to people who get extremely depressed because there's a continuous inner script which is going on. And the script is a whole play, if you like, a script of a play telling us about a drama and enforcing with each thought, with each word, um, underlying, underlining the negativity, the depression, until the depression deepens. A wonderful profile of this is contained in the Bhagavad Gita, where we see it starts with brooding. Brooding on what? Well, normally it's brooding on external or internal objects. It can be either or. And there's no external object without an internal movement. When we have a desire for something externally, it's because there's some kind of inner felt need that we wish to fill or fulfill. And so it, it begins with, re, with allowing the mind to dwell on something, a bit like an insect that lands on indiscriminately, lands on feces or a flower and doesn't care which. The mind, when left free to do what it wants to do, will follow its traditional habitual trends. And don't think that a habit is only a human habit. The whole accumulation of our experience is contained in this unit thing called ourselves. The experience that goes back to bacterial life, microscopic life, and that whole accumulation of experience is intrinsic in the process that we call evolution. And it's, but behind it is a drive leading us forward, leading us forward. And that means that all experiences are intrinsically good, even though they're registered by us as painful and bad. Sorry, Swamiji, just interject for a second, because you said something important and I just want to take note of it. So you said, if we allow the mind to just randomly um, think of thoughts, dwell on thoughts, it would be something like a fly landing on dung or whatever. But you gave me an analogy after that, which I just missed. Sorry. Because what would come up is all the habitual stuff. It's all the stuff that sits in your conscious mind. It's all the samskaras and the passions that we have called vasanas because that is the habitual way that the mind has been operating all along. And to try and change it and give it a turn is not easy. The only way to deal with the habit is to cultivate another habit. That is, we consciously direct our attention toward uplifting thoughts. In other words, using the analogy of a flower and feces, we just consciously make the mind settle on flowers instead and say your diet is only going to be like this you're only going to settle on the sweetest most beautiful flowers and using this analogy all these flowers would be all the beautiful memories that we have had in the past which have elevated the mind this is the value of pilgrimages by the way this is the value of recalling any uplifting moment in time and we can do it instantaneously. Everybody can, given a certain level of stillness, a level of calmness, a level of silence, can select a memory where they seem to be the happiest. A scene, for example, where they just were in the present moment and they just felt amazing. They just felt fantastic. And there was no selfishness involved. There was no guilt involved. It was just as it was. Earlier on today, we used an analogy of looking at a beautiful sunrise in a mountain scene. And the scene was Darjeeling that was brought up. And so when we look at that scene, and then after the fact, wonder, did we ever wonder, you know, um, what was the, um, the natural structure that brought this about and why? As soon as we look at that historical past, 
we've lost the wonder and glory of the present event. And then if we ask uh, something in the future, why is a past question? Why is it there? Well, why not? But can't you enjoy it for this moment and the next moment and the next moment? And when we do that, our breath gets taken away. Can we select a scene like that where the entire respiratory system gets suspended in a gasp of awe and wonder for that few, for that few moment, uh, moments in time? And then it gets deposited as a memory so that even away from the scene, we can recall what did it look like from moment to moment? How did we feel? Let's not try to analyze it. Simply recall it. And in that present moment, therein lies the wonder. Therein lies the glory. If we can structure our life in such a way that with every second, we can fill the mind with this joyful, elevating thought, then our whole life gets transformed because the whole subconscious area gets transformed and the outer world that corresponds to it gets transformed and people around us gets transformed. All the scenes start changing. In other words, if we say that our personal life is something like a play, we'll make sure that we author it and author it well. So this idea <clears throat> that um, uh, taking your example of praying for a curveball, for example. Of course, I make fun of it. And I don't think I ever said, please pray for a curveball. I put it as a kind of complaint. Today, life went smoothly. There were no curveballs. Now, do we like curveballs? You see, if we don't like curveballs, it's wasted. It's equivalent to saying, please give me misery. So if you really take this life as a game, if you really, if that's really your philosophical outlook, then a curveball will be a delightful thing. It won't be anything negative. And if you ask, can you give me something negative? Well, a thought is going out. It's not being neutralized by any counter thought. And that becomes your life in your day. Because you thought a curveball was something negative, something bad something that would give you pain. But I'm saying no, a curveball is a pleasant surprise. Uh, whenever I feel these question answer sessions, and I so much enjoy it, I would rather feel these questions like this, than give a talk. Because I take it as a great, great joy, uh, not only to access something of deep value and share it. That is my, my greatest joy. But it is the joy of dancing swiftly on my feet, not knowing what would come next, and learning how to return the ball smoothly with great skill. And so I would, as a person who is involved in question and answer sessions, I would say, please give me the most difficult question you can think of. Uh, so it's a curveball in that sense. If you have a preconditioned understanding that it is something negative, then it is no better than a medieval saint saying, I'm going to take this cat of nine tails and I'm going to whip the flesh off my back and wear a hair shirt so that may be, in a sense, quite good for a certain level of discipline. But really, at the end of the day, what will it do? It will produce pain. And if we're talking about the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna is also critical of that and saying that this kind of tapasya is tamasic, negative. It is full of ignorance because why would you torture? This pristine piece of equipment, this instrument called the body, it's not yours. It's only an instrument. It's an instrument there for the glory of the divine. 
Is this man who is blind from birth, is it his sin or that of his parents? Jesus answers, neither. Therefore, the glory of the Father, the glory of the divine. And so can we look at the whole of life as a glorious display given to us freely, resources on the one side, our wonderful equipment on the other. You know, when people talk about nature, they talk about nature as if the human body and the human mind and that combination has nothing to do with nature. No, it's part of nature. Everything that is objective is part of nature. But what is behind it? What is behind it is that steady one that never changes. And we can see it, not directly, but via its glory that is displayed everywhere. So let my day be glorious. And within that glory, give me some great surprises where I can enjoy dancing and playing with thee. Why not? So that's a, a slightly different kind of understanding to the one you may have gotten when we bring up the language of curveball. Yes, if you really take this life to be a game, a play, a play of disseminating waves, combining, recombining with its permutations and combinations that produce this stimulated by a firm intention, a thought, a noble thought. Let noble thoughts come to me from all sides, say the Vedas in a prayer. Yes, let noble thoughts come to me from all sides. Let me digest these and let me saturate my mind with these. Let me transform my whole body and mind and all around me as well. Let me be a shining light that beams for others. Why not? And so uh, we have to learn to take things up a level, notch by notch. Is it good to have and enjoy and celebrate a success? Yes. Is it better to offer all these successes and victories to their source? It gives greater joy. Yes. Should we do it to get the joy? No. <laughs> but we're doing it because the author and real doer of this is not us. Neither us on the fundamental level of the Atman, that entity that remains ever steady, nor is it uh, from the point of view of a personal actor or a doer or a profiteer. We are none of those. We are have not entitled to any of that. But the joy is in letting it go and giving it up. And in order to do that, we will have to be present orientated. This second, this moment, this moment we'll have to catch. And it's in this moment that you find the glory of the sunset, a sunrise. It is not in a post-mortem condition and it is not in the future tense. And it is not regretting in the past. I wish the clouds were not there today. No, you accept it. You accept it here, you accept it now for what it is. So we have to learn to replace the past regret, what a pity with what a glory, and the future as a series of uh, free gifts that are about to enter into our field freely given and uh, full of full of uh, uh, full of blessings and full of the highest values we can ever think of i suppose the problem you see in spiritual practices when we view spiritual practice as religious practice there's a difference and if we think that uh, our spiritual practice is equivalent to going to a church or um, following a set of ritualistic principles, then we have missed the point. 
religion is realization. It's not my definition. It belongs to Swami Vivekananda. And what is that realization? It is the realization that the glory is with us here, now, all around us in this moment. How can we miss it? We can miss it by asking why. Why is a past question. It has no value. Why not? What next? That has a value. Or by anticipating with a fearfulness what may or may not happen in the future and how to prevent it and how to steer it. I'm not saying we should not do planning. But planning is, like anything else, is an exercise that can be done also in the present moment, just as a necessary activity. So these are some of the, the, the points that, that I would I would say and bring to you. See, the only way to make sense of life is to use this phrase, this word Leela. There was a uh, Raynaud Johnson who was Nobel Prize winner. He writes a book in Prison Splendor. In his last chapter, he says he was a scientist, but he was also an investigator in all kinds of phenomena, not being afraid to investigate them in a serious way. And his final conclusion is the only way we can make sense of all of this is if we take the Indian concept of Leela, that it is a play, a play of waves. And we can see this play, this dancing aspect of it. There's a good reason why um, outside the CERN laboratory in Switzerland, the large Hedron Collider, the largest laboratory in the world, why there is a bronze image, bronze statue outside of a dancing Shiva, Nataraja. There's a very good reason for it. Because when you look at this image, you can't help but think that what we are studying in physics is nothing more than a play. Dancing atoms, dancing subatomic particles appearing, disappearing. Appearing, and before we can catch them, disappearing, just as suddenly. Appearing and disappearing just as, as quickly. Not eluding our capture, eluding our registration, no matter how much we try to verify it. It has to be done time and time again. Millions and billions of items of data have to be collected, analyzed, registered and put down and compared. When we look at what we have at the fundamental level, it's not what we find in terms of tables and chairs, in terms of clothing, in terms of our activities of eating and drinking and sleeping. It defies all our imagination. And yet, that's precisely what the tables and chairs are made from. It doesn't look like that. So we have to really uh, understand this um, play aspect. And if we take it like that, and if we understand, all right, let us see how it looks when we view it from that point of view, then our whole way of looking at life will be different. We won't take anything that seriously. So that's what I would have. And of course, certain personality types, I won't mention who, because some people haven't done this Enneagram, but certain personality types will will be naturally, wonderfully um, adapted to that way of thinking. Okay. Thank you for that. So, so, so use what you have, yeah. use what you have, because yeah. other people who don't naturally have that view. But you see, if you use it in a negative way, if you use it as a way of avoiding pain, now the panacea, the antidote is not, okay, let me embrace pain. That's not the antidote. Nor is the antidote to transmute what is painful into something which, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which denies the reality of something. But it is to see things for what they are and then to engage 
uh, fearlessly, absolutely fearlessly in it. Uh, one of the questions that came up uh, today in Dungannon was that somebody realized, you know, the problem in life is our personal fear, fearfulness. We are, <coughs> we, we have a fear of all kinds of things. And yes, because the primary fear is the fear of non-existence, the fear of having no meaning, the fear of personal extinction, non-existence. That's why we resist death so much. In past pandemics, and I don't mean to put this out as a, as a non-feeling kind of thing. Oh, thank you. But uh, just as a statement of fact, in past pandemics, uh, populations were decimated. And, uh, and things revived well after that. And we can learn perhaps a lesson in nature. You know, if you want good, fresh grass to grow in Africa, there are, nature has a way of dealing with it. Nature provides such heat that bushfires occur. And after bushfires, there's these new succulent shoots of grass come. So uh, my point is this, that um, we are clinging on to life at all costs. This is one of the glaciers or obstacles, we mentioned obstacles previously. It's one of the great and final obstacles that we have, this clinging to life at all costs, doing it as if life were an absolute full stop rather than a comma. But it's a comma, you know, it's not a full stop. And it's a cyclical affair. It's not a linear business. So we want to make it a linear business by getting out of this continuous cycle of causal relationships where we don't learn anything. Ramakrishna gives the great example. Despite the fact that a friendly person may point out to a camel, you see, my friend, when you chew thorns, blood will ooze from your mouth and you'll get your mouth will be sore. And the camel says, yes, yes, I know, as he chews the thorns and reaches out for more thorns. So we have to learn some different formulas. We have to learn to uh, use our inherent capability to get around obstacles. There are alternatives. One alternative in life is to head for something and crash into it head on. The other one is to withdraw and run away. And another third one might be just to do nothing about it, just to yield. But there is another way. There's a fourth way. And the fourth way is to see the worth, the worthiness in things at, at, its, at its root, at everything's root, and how it gets manifested beautifully from there. And then we replace everything with that final formula of love. And when I say love, there's an intangible thing I'm talking about, but everybody knows what it is. And if you want to put some words to it, well, love is a complete unconditional manifestation of generosity, a spreading of goodness everywhere without any sense of any reward, a kind of bonhomie attitude that has a willingness to bless all beings, regardless of the consequences to themselves, like a generous free entity beaming and spreading goodness everywhere with no consideration for themselves, except to say, let there be a wonderful totality everywhere. And totality is all inclusive. It includes you. So all the prayers within Hinduism, for example, will tell us something equivalent to, may all beings be happy. We say all beings, that includes you. May everybody be happy. You remember that example I give of the farmer 
who has a drought in his field in Africa and he desperately wants rain. So he prays to God, Lord, Lord, please give me rain. <clears throat> and so in the heavenly realms, in the storehouse of rainfall, all the rainfall comes to his farm and destroys all his crops from flood. Had he said, may all get rain, may everybody have rain, may all the farmers have rain, it would be including himself, may we all get rain. Then the rain would be nicely distributed everywhere. So there is practicality in this generosity of spirit. See, we don't, don't forget the beautiful definition that Swami Vivekananda gives us of love that has no reward, no rival, and no fear. You cannot have love or the espousal of love if you're also preaching fear. It just doesn't work. It's counter. These are the paradoxical opposites of each other. Love and fear, they don't go together. And I know <clears throat> out of fear for him, the wind blows. There's a passage like that in the Upanishads. But what it means is that that being there, naturally everything else has to fall into its rhythmic natural state as a result. But that is the only place where even the word fear is used in, a, in, a, in an objective sense. Otherwise, you see, our goal is fearlessness, our buyer. You see how Buddha holds his hand up, fear not. You see how Ganesha holds his hand up, fear not. You see how all the deities hold their hands up, fear not. It's one consistent thing in iconography that we see in the Eastern tradition. This fearlessness on the one hand, and on the other hand, giving, giving. A generosity of spirit on the one hand, and assurance on the other. So we have to learn that things are assuredly well. Julian of Norwich famously said, and all things shall be well, all things shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. That kind of faith and confidence we have to have. And then we play the game well. If it is a game, we should play it well. Let us play every inch of it well. Let us play every scene to its maximum. Let us do it with delight. Then what a glory it is. That gives an extra surge, an extra inner uh, upliftment over and above your normal, so-called normal successes. Congratulate yourself in success, but take it one step further. And even your feeling of euphoria over a success, offer that. Because it doesn't belong to you. The, in, the feeling and the capacity to feel inside an internal excitement is not there because you put it there. It's nothing to do with you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Oh, shanti, shanti, shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Oh.